الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام الرسول اللہ وال علی وصاب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان الدین ان دل اسلام رب شہلی صدری و یسلی عمری وحل العقد تم السان یف کہ حکولی مائی اسپیشل ایلڈرس اینڈ مائی ڈر بزر سسٹرس آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود دا اسلام گریٹنگس السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ می پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگس آف اللہ سبحان و تعالی آف آل مائی گاڈ بی آن آل آف یو دا ٹاپک آف دس مارننگ اسٹاک از اسلام دا سلیوشن ناٹ دا پرابلم فار مین کائنڈ اسلام از ڈرائیو فرام دا عربک ورڈ سلم وچ میز پیس اٹس آلسو ڈرائیو فرام دا عربک ورڈ سلم وچ مینس ٹو سبمٹ یور ول ٹو اللہ ٹو آل مائی گاڈ ان شارٹ اسلام مینس پیس اکوائرڈ بائی سبمٹنگ یور ول ٹو آل مائی گاڈ اینڈ اینی ون ہو سبمٹس ول ٹو آل مائی گاڈ ہی از کالڈ ایز اے مسلم unlike the other religions which mainly cater only to the spiritual aspect or some ways of life which only cater to the physical aspect of the human being islam caters to both the physical as well as the spiritual need of the human being it caters to the body as well as the soul of the human being and the cornerstone of this islamic faith is the glorious quran This glorious Quran is the most positive book in the world. <clears throat> It is a proclamation to humanity, a fountain of mercy and wisdom, a warning to the heedless, a guide to the erring, an assurance to those in doubt, a solace to the suffering, and a hope to those in despair. Can you reduce the bass a bit from there? The bass low and the high settle a bit. <clears throat> Make the bass a bit low and the high, increase the highs and slight effect and even the gains are right. <clears throat> the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God which was revealed to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. We Muslims we will surely agree that this quran is the solution to the problems of human kind and we believe that this is the last and final revelation of almighty god but most of the non muslims they may not agree that this quran is a word of almighty god there are many human beings who may not believe in god itself so where is the question of the quran being the word of god and whenever you follow the advice or the solution of any person first you want to know the credential of the person who is giving you the solution for example if your mother is suffering from a heart problem and if a layman comes and gives you advice but natural you will not listen to him on the contrary if a heart specialist who is very famous if he comes and gives you advice for the heart problem of your mother but natural you will listen to him similarly first we have to know the credential of the source that is giving the solution to the problems of human kind let us examine the source that is the glorious quran whether is it really the word of god how can we satisfy the non muslims how can we satisfy the atheist that this glorious quran which is the word of god has the solution to the problems of human kind inshallah in the starting part of my talk while i prove to the atheist that the quran is the word of god i will even prove to the non muslims those who believe in god that this quran is the word of almighty god 
Whenever I meet an atheist, the first thing I do is I congratulate him. The reason I congratulate an atheist is because he is thinking. Unlike the other human beings who are blindly following their parents, for example, that person is a Christian because father is a Christian. The Hindus, most of them are Hindus because their parents are Hindus. Many of the Muslims, they are Muslims because their parents are Muslims. This atheist, he is thinking. His parents may be coming from religious background, but he does not accept that the God which his parents are worshipping can be considered to be Almighty God. That's the reason he does not believe in Almighty God. Now people may wonder that why is Zakir congratulated an atheist? The reason I'm congratulating him is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, the first part of the Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is prove to him, Illallah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. So half my job is done. To the other non-Muslims, first I have to prove to them that the God they are worshipping is not the true God. And then I have to convince them about the true Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To this atheist, half my job is done. He already agrees there is no God. La ilaha. The only thing I have to do is Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. The first question that I'll ask an atheist is that suppose there is a machine, an equipment, which no one in the world has ever seen before. And if it is bought in front of you, and if the question is asked that who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment? Who is the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this machine? which no one in the world has ever seen, if it is bought in front of the atheist and it asks the question that who is the first person in this universe who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this new machine who no one has seen. The reply the atheist will give is that the creator of that machine. Some atheists will say the manufacturer of that machine. Some will say the inventor. Some will say the producer. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Either it will be the creator, the producer, the manufacturer, the inventor. Whatever the atheist says, keep it at the back of your mind. And then ask them the question. That how did our universe come into existence? And if we analyze that most of these atheists, they believe in science and technology. And they think that science has advanced so much, that's what makes them an atheist. So when we ask this question to him, that how did, how did our universe come into existence? So he will tell us that initially our universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a big bang. There was a secondary separation which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the sun, the moon and the planet on which we live, the earth. When we ask this question, when did you come to know about this creation of the universe? So he will tell us, about 30 to 40 years back, there were a couple of scientists who described how did our universe come into existence. But what the atheist is talking about is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. It's mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Awalam yaral lazina kafru. Do not the unbelievers see Anna samawati wal arda kan kan saknahuma, that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This big bang with the atheists we're talking about is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned in this book the Quran 1400 years ago about the creation of the universe? So the atheist may say, maybe it's a flock. Don't argue with him. Continue. Ask him the next question. That what is the shape of this earth on which we live? So he will tell you that previously the people thought that the world was flat. It is recently, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, we have come to know that the world is spherical. 
And if he has knowledge of science, he will tell you, the first person who proved that the world was spherical was Sir Francis Drake in 1597 when he sailed around the earth. We tell the date here. That is the Quran mentioned in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Wal ard baad azalika dhaha. Thereafter, we have made the earth egg shaped. The Arabic word dhaha, one of its meaning is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know that the world, the earth, on which we live is not completely round like a ball. It is geospherical in shape. It is flattened from the pole. And the Arabic word duya does not refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Imagine the glorious Quran mentions 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? And the atheist may say, maybe your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was an intelligent man. Maybe he wrote it. Don't argue with him. Ask him the next question. That the light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So the atheist will tell us that previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently, 100 years back, 200 years back, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is the reflected light of the sun. The Quran mentions 400 years ago, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he who has made the constellation in the sky, and placed therein sun having its own light, and moon having borrowed light. All the places in the Quran, the moonlight is described as munir or nur, meaning borrowed light or reflection of light. Nowhere in the Quran is the light of the moon described as its own light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran that the light of the moon is not its own light but a reflected light or borrowed light? The atheist may say, maybe your prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was super intelligent. Don't argue with him. Continue. When I was in school, I had learned in school, I passed my school in 1982. I had learned in the subject of geography and science that the sun did not rotate about its own axis. It was stationary. It revolved, but it did not rotate about its own axis. So the atheist will ask, is that what is mentioned in your Quran? I said, no, that is what I read in school. About 23 years back, I read in school that the sun was stationary, it did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, Huwa lazi khalaka layl wa nahara. It is Allah who has created the night and the day. Wa shamsa wa kamar, the sun and the moon. Kullun fi faliki yasbuhun, each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Quran says that the sun, besides revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. Who could have mentioned in the Quran that the sun rotate about its own axis, which we have come to know recently. With the help of an equipment, we can have the image of the sun on a tabletop, and we see that the sun has got black spots, and it takes about 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes about 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? And the atheist will give a pause. Don't wait for the reply. Continue. Today, science tells us that the universe we are living is expanding. And this is exactly what is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years back. In Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47, where it mentioned that we have created the expanding universe, the vastness of space. The Arabic word, Mu'siyuna, means expanding, vastness of space. In the field of geography, in the field of hydrology, in school, we learned about the water cycle. And the water cycle that we learned was first described by Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580. And if you ask him, what is the water cycle? So he will tell us. 
that science today tells us that the water from the ocean evaporates. It forms into clouds. It moves into the interior. It falls on that rain and then it replenishes the water table and the water cycle is completed. This water cycle which was first described by Sir Bernard Paris in 1580 is mentioned in the Quran in several places. In several of the ayahs of the Quran, it talks about the water cycle. How does the water evaporate from the ocean, forms into clouds, the clouds move to the interior, it falls down as rain, and the water table is replenished, and the water cycle is complete. This water cycle is mentioned in the Quran in great detail in several verses. In Surah Az-Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 18. In Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verse 22. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 48 to 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. In Surah Al Waqiyah, chapter 56, verse number 68 to 70. In Surah Mul, chapter number 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. The glorious Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several verses. You can only give a talk on the various verses which the Quran speaks about the water cycle. Who could have mentioned about the water cycle 1400 years ago? And again, there will be long pause. The atheist will not reply. But don't wait for the answer. You can continue. The Quran speaks about oceanology. Quran says, in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 53, that it is he who has created two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, and the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier between them, which is forbidden to be trespassed. The same message repeated in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19 and 20. Marajal Bahraini al Taqyan, Baina Mabarzakhul Ayyabhyan. It is he who has let free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today science tells us that there are two types of water, one sweet and the other salty. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. The Quran speaks about geology. Today science tells us that the mountain that we see on top of the earth is only a small portion. The major portion is deep within the ground. And this mountain, these mountains which have roots, it prevents the earth from shaking. This is exactly what the Quran mentioned 14 years ago in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, where it says, We have, we have created the earth as an expanse, while Jabal Autada and the mountains as stakes, as tent pegs. The Arabic word autad means tent pegs, it means stakes. Like how we hammer a tent peg into the ground, we see only the head, a small portion on top, and the major portion is down. Today science says that the mountains have good roots, which give stability to the earth, which is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, that we have placed on the earth mountain standing firm, lest it would shake with you. What the geologists have discovered recently in science, 30 years back, 40 years back, <clears throat> the Quran mentions 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about biology. Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yaran lazina kafaru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kant ratkan sakna huma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clothed them asunder. And we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? The Quran mentions 1400 years ago that every living thing is made from water. Who could have imagined in the deserts of Arabia that every living thing is made from water? Today science testifies that every living creature is made from water. The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, we have created every animal from water. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 54, we have created every human being from water. 
in the field of botany, we have recently come to know that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, it is he who sends on water from the sky, and from it he brings forth diverse pairs of plants, each separate from the other. The Quran says that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. The Quran says in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that even the fruits are created in pairs, in sexes, male and female. In the field of zoology, the Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 60 and 69. It speaks about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41. It speaks about the lifestyle of the ant in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18. The Quran even speaks about medicine in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 69, that from the belly, we, from the belly of the bee, we give you a drink of varying colors in which there is healing for humankind. Today, science has come to know that the honey is obtained from the belly of the bee, and in the honey, there is healing for the humankind. The Quran speaks about physiology, which we have come to know recently. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 66, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, it speaks about the blood circulation and the production of milk. The Quran speaks about embryology, that we have been created from a leech-like substance in Surah Ikra, chapter number 96, verse number 1. It speaks about the various embryological stages in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. It speaks about genetics in Surah Najm, chapter number 53, verse number 45 and 46, that it is the man, it is the male fluid who is responsible for the sex of the child. After every scientific aspect, if we ask the atheist, who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The Quran speaks about the fingerprinting method, which was discovered in 1880, 1400 years ago, Quran says in Surah Qiyama, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, it talks about the fingerprinting method. And when we ask the atheist after every scientific sign mentioned in the Quran, that who could have mentioned this in the Quran, the only reply he can give you is the Creator the manufacturer, the inventor, the producer. This creator, this manufacturer, this inventor, this producer, we Muslims call him as Allah. So with the help of the Quran, we can prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This book, all what I mentioned, this book is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. -S. There are more than 6,000 signs, ayahs in the glorious Quran, out of which more than a thousand speak about science. And this book is the book of the creator of the universe, the manufacturer, the inventor, the producer of this universe, whom we call as Allah. That's the reason today, science is not eliminating God, it is eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. And according to the famous scientist, as well as philosopher, Francis Bacon, he said that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist, but the in-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in Almighty God. So this is the source for the solution for the problems of humankind. The glorious Quran, which is the last and final revelation of Almighty God, which was revealed to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I've already discussed earlier in this exhibition, and when I had come earlier in Chennai, about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his prophecies are mentioned in the scriptures of all the major world religions. Now, once you know the credentials of the source, a person would like to listen to the solution. Only after you come to know the credential of the source, will you give it a hearing. This Quran has the solution to the problems of humankind. And because it was the last and final revelation, it was not only revealed for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was revealed for the whole of humankind. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, 
chapter number 14, verse number 1. This is a book we have revealed to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so that thou may lead us mankind from darkness to light. Not only lead the Muslims or the Arabs, but lead the whole of mankind from darkness to light. Allah repeats the message in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. Here is a message for mankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. Allah repeats the message in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, that Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to humankind, as a criteria to judge right from wrong. Allah says in Surah Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 41, that it has revealed to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, this book, the glorious Quran, to instruct the humankind, not only to instruct the Muslims or the Arabs, but to instruct the whole of humankind. So this Quran, which is the last and final revelation, does not have the solutions only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it has the solution for the whole of humankind. But, unfortunately, we find today on the international media, in the international newspapers, in the international magazines, on the radio broadcast station, on the television channels, on the satellite channels, there is virulent propaganda about Islam. These international media, they are bombarding information about Islam, which is totally wrong. They are saying that Islam is the problem for humankind. And according to an article, which came in Time magazine on the 16th of April, 1979, it says that in a span of 150 years, between 1800 and 1950, more than 60,000 books have been written against Islam. If we calculate, more than one book a day has been written against Islam in this span of 150 years. But in the recent times, especially after 11 September 2001, this has reached epidemic levels. Now, there are several books written against Islam every day. And most of these books, they try and portray that Islam is the problem for humankind. It is the major problem. And what does the international media do? What do they do? They pick up the black sheep of the Muslim community. And they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. They pick up the black sheep of the community and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. Every community has got black sheep. For example, if you want to know how good is the latest car in the market, suppose there is the latest model, 600 ICL of the Mercedes, that has been launched, 2005 model, and you want to know how good the car is. And suppose a person who does not know how to drive the car, sits behind the wheel and bangs up the car. Who will you blame? Will you blame the car or the driver? Who will you blame? The car or the driver? The driver. If you want to know how good the car is, you have to analyze the specification. What are its safety measures? What is its speed? What is its average? How good is the pickup? How many gears does it have? All these things, after analyzing, we can judge how good the car is. And if you really want to test drive the car, put behind the steering wheel a driver who is an expert driver. So if you have to judge Islam, Judge upon the authentic sources, the Quran and the authentic Hadith, not by the followers. And if you really want to judge by its followers, the best example is the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the best exemplary Muslim and the best exemplary human being, as the Quran says in Surah Kalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, that verily thou art standeth on the highest standard of character. The Quran says in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 21, that verily in the messenger will you find a very beautiful example. 
So if you want to judge how good the religion is, and if you want to know according to a follower, the best example is the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad So what does the media do? One type, one strategy it utilizes, it picks up the blushes of the community and it portrays as though they are exemplary. And we will find in the newspapers, in the Indian newspaper, that the Arab has come and he has married an 18-year-old girl. A 50-year-old Arab has come and married an 18-year-old girl and it comes in the front page, headlines. But when a 50-year-old non-Muslim rapes a 12-year-old girl, it comes in the news briefs. In the news briefs. This is how the media plays. The media can make a hero into a villain and a villain into a hero. It can convert day into night. It can convert night into day. The second strategy they use is they talk about, they talk things about Islam which are alien to Islam. It is unheard of in Islam. And they attribute things to Islam which do not belong to this religion. It does not belong to Islam. Either by misquoting verses of the Quran, misquoting the Hadith, and they portray Islam things like Islam is a religion of terrorism. So these things is the second strategy. And the third, they pick up teachings of Islam which are there in Islam and they say that these are the problems of humankind. And inshallah, this part of my talk will be dedicated to this third strategy. The first strategy, every community has black sheep. The second strategy, it's alien to Islam. The things that they mention, it's not found in Islam, it's just misquotation. The third strategy, they pick up teachings of Islam and they portray as though these are the problems for humankind. The Muslims, they are fundamentalists. That's the reason humankind is in problem. They are extremists. They are terrorists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a mathematician has to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know. If we refer to the Oxford Dictionary, it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. But if we refer to the revised edition, the new edition of Oxford Dictionary, there's a change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion, especially Islam. The word especially Islam has been added to the revised edition of the Oxford Dictionary. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, you immediately start thinking of a Muslim. He's an extremist. He's a terrorist. And what happens is that most of us Muslims, we go on the defense. No, 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 I'm not a fundamentalist. You cannot be a good Muslim unless you are a fundamentalist Muslim. If you are not a fundamentalist Muslim, you cannot be a good Muslim. The media says, Muslims are extremists. And I tell them, yes, I'm an extremist. I'm extremely kind. I'm extremely honest. I'm extremely just. I'm extremely merciful. What's wrong in being an extremist? What's wrong in being extremely kind, extremely just, extremely honest, extremely merciful? Can any human being tell me that being extremely honest is wrong? Can any human being tell me that being extremely just is wrong? What's wrong in being an extremist as long as you are extremist in the correct direction? Allah says in the Quran you should be extremely honest. So Allah tells us to be an extremist in the right direction. Extremely honest, extremely kind, extremely merciful. You have to be extremely just. We should not be extremists in the wrong direction. 
So unfortunately, we Muslims, we are apologetic. No, I'm not a fundamentalist, I'm not extremist. We have to turn the tables over. We should know how to counter this media, this propaganda against Islam. And we should be proud to be Muslims. The media labels the Muslims as terrorists. I say that every Muslim should be a terrorist. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? Terrorist by definition means a person who causes terror. For example, if a robber sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the robber, the policeman is a terrorist. So in this context, every Muslim should be a terrorist to the antisocial element. Whenever a robber sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever a rapist sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any antisocial element sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. I am aware that today the word terrorist is more commonly used for a person who terrorizes an innocent human being. In this context, no Muslim should ever terrorize any innocent human being. People tell me that, Brother Zakir, aren't you playing with words? I said, this is English language. One year back, in December 2003, there's an article that came in Times of India, which read, Inspector Angre, Inspector Angre terrorizes the underworld. So I got this idea from the Inspector Angre, he was a specialist in encounter. Any underworld, he said, encounter and shoot them. So it came as headline, Inspector Angre is a terrorist for the underworld. So that's good. What's wrong in being a terrorist to the antisocial element? And many a times, two different labels are given to the same activity of the same individual. For example, before our country, India, got its independence, we were ruled by the Britishers, these, and there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. These people, many of the freedom fighters, by the Britishers, they were called as terrorists. But we Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. The British government calls them terrorists, we call them patriots. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you would call these people as patriots, as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. Therefore, before you give a label to any individual, first you have to find out for what reason is he striving. And this we find very often in the media. For example, Nelson Mandela, before the new South Africa got its independence from the white apartheid government, the white apartheid government had arrested Nelson Mandela and put him in Robben Island for 27 years. And they called him as number one terrorist. Later on, after South Africa gets its freedom, he is released. And the common indigenous South Africans, they called Nelson Mandela as a hero. If you agree with the view of the white apartheid government that the color of the skin, if it's white, makes you superior, then we have to call Nelson Mandela as a terrorist. But if you agree with the view of the indigenous South African that the color of the skin does not make you superior, or as Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa jalnaakum shu'ubam wa qaba ila litaarafu inna kamakum in dallahi atkakum inna la alimun khabir O humankind! We have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah, Almighty God, is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God, it is not wealth, it's not color of the skin, it's not sex, 
but it is taqwa, it is God consciousness, it is piety, it is righteousness. So if you agree with the view of the Quran that the color of the skin does not make you superior, then we have to agree that Nelson Mandela was fighting for a just cause. And the irony of the whole issue is that after Nelson Mandela is released, he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine, the person who was terrorist number one, after a few years, gets the Nobel Prize for Peace for the same activity. So this is how they convert black into white, and white into black, day into night, and night into day. Therefore, the Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 6, whenever you get the information, check it up before you pass it on to the third person. And today, <clears throat> Islam is labeled as the problem for humankind, which is actually the solution. If every human being becomes a fundamentalist Muslim, the problems of humankind will be solved. If every human being becomes an extremist Muslim, extremely kind, extremely just, extremely honest, extremely merciful, the problem of humankind will be solved. If every human being terrorizes the anti-social element, all the bad things in the world will stop. Actually, Islam is the solution, not the problem for humankind. And if we analyze all the major regions of the world, they speak good things. And even many laws of the country, many of the laws are good laws. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam, besides speaking about good things, shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. For example, Hinduism says that you should not rob. Christianity says you should not rob. Islam says the same. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religions? What is the difference between Islam and the law of the other countries? India says we should not rob. America says we should not rob. The difference is Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not rob. Islam has prescribed zakat. It is the pillar of Islam that every rich person who has the saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, should give 2.5% of his excess wealth every lunar year in charity. If every rich human being gives charity, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. After that, the glorious Quran says, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, As to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Almighty God. Chopping off the hands in this age of science and technology, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. This is what the media says. And many non-Muslims think that if you go to Saudi Arabia, where this law is practiced, every second person you come across will have his hand chopped off. I have been to Saudi Arabia several times. I have not come across a single person with his hand chopped off. There will be some people whose hands may have been chopped off, but it's not as common as the non-Muslims think it is. The law is so stringent that a person will think a thousand times before robbing. You know America, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, do you know it has one of the highest rate of theft and robbery in the world? I'm asking a simple question. That if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that with all the rich people who have a saving of more than the Nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, they should give 2.5% of their wealth in charity every lunar year. I am asking the question. And after that, if any man or woman robs, chop of his or her hand as a punishment, I am asking a question. Will the rate of robbery and theft in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. The moment you implement the Sharia, you get results. That's the reason I say that Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. 
People say, oh, this religion of barbarism, chopping off the hands, it is the only solution. And we know one of the countries in Africa, they implemented the Islamic Sharia just a couple of years back, and immediately the rate of robbery came down. You implement this law in any part of the world. That's the reason the least rate of robbery and theft in any part, in any country in the world is in Saudi Arabia. And some of the people, they think it's upside down country. If you go to Makkah, they have big jewelry shops, having gold worth crores of rupees, millions of dollars. And during time for Salah, they just put a string. The shop is closed. You know, people will think it's upside down country. Crores of rupees worth of gold and just a string. No doors, no lock. The law is so stringent, not that the police of Saudi Arabia are very expert. The American police is supposed to be more expert, you know, more, more trained, more armed than ammunition. But yet, it's the country which has one of the highest rate of robbery and theft. You implement the Sharia and immediately you get results. Let me give you one more example. Most of the religions say that you should not molest a woman, that you should not rape a woman. Hinduism says that. Christianity says that. Islam says the same. But Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not molest or rape any woman. Islam has the system of hijab. Normally people talk about hijab for the woman, but Allah in the glorious Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, any unashamed thought, any brazen thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. Once there was a Muslim who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's not allowed in Islam. So he told me, a beloved prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited, I have not completed half my glance. What did the prophet mean by saying that the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited? What the prophet meant was, unintentionally if you look at a girl, don't intentionally look at her again to feast on her beauty. That does not mean you can look at a girl for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty, and display not a beauty except what appears ordinarily of, and draw a head covering her veil over the bosoms, and display not a beauty except in front of her father's her husband, her sons, and a big list of mahram, the close relatives who she can't marry, is given. There are basically six criteria for hijab given in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. There are certain scholars that say that even this should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same between the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not be a sign of the unbeliever. These are basically the six criteria for hijab. And the Quran says in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak, put on the jilbab, so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Quran says, hijab has been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. For example, if there are two twin sisters, who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful. And if they're walking down the streets of Chennai, one of them is wearing the Islamic hijab, the complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist. And the other twin sister, she's wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or shorts. And if both of them are walking down the streets of Chennai, and if round the corner there is a 
hooligan who's waiting for a catch. There's a ruffian who's waiting to tease a girl, to molest a girl, to rape a girl. Which girl will he tease? The girl in the Islamic hijab? Or will he tease the girl wearing the western clothes, the mini skirts or shorts? Which girl will he tease? Which girl will he tease? But naturally the girl wearing the western clothes. So Quran rightly says that hijab prevents the woman from being molested. And after this, the Islamic Sharia says, if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment. He gets death penalty. People say, death penalty? In this age of science and technology, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. But when I ask this question to non-Muslims, that God forbid, if someone rapes your mother, or someone rapes your sister, and if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is born in front of you, what punishment will you give him? And believe me, all of them said, we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying, we will torture him to death. So why these double standards? Someone rapes your sister, your mother, you want to put him to death. Somebody rapes somebody else's mother, somebody else's sister, you say, death penalty is a barbaric law. Why these double standards? And America, which the world looks up upon to be the most advanced country in the world, do you know it has one of the highest rate of rape in the world? According to the FBI statistics of 1990, every day on average, 1,756 cases of rape took place. <clears throat> According to the statistics of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice Crime Bureau, it said that in the year 1996, on average, every day, 2,713 cases of rape took place. In 1990, every day, 1,756. In 1996, six years later, 2,713 every day. Maybe the Americans got more bold. That means, in the year 1996, every 32 to second, one rape is taking place. In America, on average, every 32 to second, one rape is taking place. You know, we are here, we have gathered here for more than one hour. Already more than 100 rapes may have taken place in America uh, since the time we are here. I am asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia, that any man looks at a woman, any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. After that, the woman should wear the Islamic hijab, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, capital punishment, death penalty, I am asking the question, will the rate of rape in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That's the reason I say that Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a practical way how to achieve the state of goodness. Therefore, I say that Islam is the solution to the problems of humankind. It's the solution. And unfortunately, the media they portray something else. Oh, Islam subjugates the woman by keeping her in hijab. Actually, it's, Islam is protecting the woman by keeping her in hijab. But the media says, Islam subjugates the woman. Why? Because if all the women are protected, how will these Westerners enjoy life? How? Oh. And if we analyze in the name, of women's liberalization. This Western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, deprivation of honor, and degradation of a soul. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a status of concubine, to a status of mistresses, and society butterflies, which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers and sex marketeers which are hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. In the name of art and culture, they are actually degrading the woman in the name of women's liberalization. And if you hear my talk on women's rights in Islam, I've given details of this aspect. Today we find the Western world saying that we have liberated the women. And we find they're using them as mere tools in the guise of art and culture. 
hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. For example, when we see the advertisement of a motorcycle, invariably you'll find a woman in it. Now, how many women ride motorcycles? So motorcycles are mainly ridden by men. So what is the woman doing in ad? If you see an ad in the car, invariably, in most of the ads, to attract the male, you find the woman in the ad. And I was told one of the very famous ads of the BMW. The BMW car, it's a very famous car for the youngsters. How the Mercedes has its own caliber for the people of status. For the youngsters, it is BMW, equivalent to Mercedes. It's a faster car. It's a sports car. Better pickup. So BMW is of the level of Mercedes. I was told in an ad of a BMW car, in front of the car, there was a lady standing in a bikini, and it read, test drive her now. Who is the girl of the car? What, what are they doing? They are selling our daughters. They are selling our mothers. They are selling, selling their daughters, their mothers, their wives. We do not want this. The hijab protects the woman, does not subjugate her. So hijab is the solution for humankind. It is not the problem. What the media portrays, oh, it's the problem for the woman, it is actually the solution. If hijab is a problem and Islam is a problem for the woman, do you know, out of those non-Muslims who are accepting Islam, Two-thirds of them are women. If Islam is a problem for womankind, then why are the women accepting Islam? More than 60 to 65 percent of the non-Muslim accepting Islam, they are women. So if Islam is a problem, why are these Westerners, these Americans, these Europeans, why are the American women accepting Islam? Why are the European women accepting Islam? Because they know it is the solution to the problem of womankind. And there are various aspects. You can continue for the full day. I'll mention one more aspect. That they pick up teachings of Islam, which are there in Islam, but they portray as though that is a problem. One of the things very commonly picked up by the media is that Islam permits a man to have more than one wife. You know, polygamy is allowed in Islam. Therefore, it's a problem. In fact, Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which says marry only one. You read any other religious book, whether it be Ramayan, Mahabharat, Gita, Bible, no religious book on the face of the earth says marry only one except the Quran. If you read the Hindu scriptures, if you read Ramayan, the father of Sri Ram, King Dashrath, he had more than one wife. If you read Mahabharat, Sri Krishna, how many wives he had? Four? 10,000, he had 16,108 wives. So in Krishna can have 16,108 wives, so why can't we Muslims have maximum four? If you read the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures, the Bible, it says that Abraham had three wives. Peace be upon him. It says that Solomon, peace be upon him, had 700 wives. So if you read the religious scriptures, the religious scriptures of all the other religions besides Islam, they give you permission to have as many wives as you wish. Four, ten, thousand, ten thousand, no upper limit. It is later on, the human beings have put a restriction. The Jewish scriptures give permission for the Jews to have as many wives as they wish. It is Rabbi Gen Gen Yehuda, who passed a synoid that the Jews should marry only one woman. It is the Christian church which put a restriction that the Christian should marry only one, not the Bible. It is the Indian government under the Hindu Special Marriage Act in 1954 told that the Hindus can marry only one woman. It is not the Hindu scriptures. It is a law passed by the Indian government in 1954 under the Hindu Special Marriage Act that the Hindus can marry only one. It is not the scriptures. And if you see the statistics of the government status of women in Islam on page number 60 and 67, it gave the statistics of the polygamous marriages in a span of 10 years between 1951 to 1961. 
And the Muslims, the statistics said, the Indian Muslims, 4.31% did polygamous marriages. And the Hindus, 5.06. So according to the government statistics, the Hindus are doing more polygamous marriages than the Muslims. Let's analyze what does the Quran say. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 3, marry a woman of a choice in twos, threes or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. This statement that marry only one is only given in the Quran and no other religious scripture. That you can marry two, threes or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. And the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 129, it is difficult, it is next to impossible to do justice between your wives, but don't turn away from them altogether. Marrying more than one wife, polygyny, in Islam, it is muba, optional. It's not fard. Many non-Muslim think it is compulsory that a Muslim should have more than one wife, should have four wives. It's optional. But if you marry more than one wife, and if you can't do justice between the two, or the three or the four you have, then you have a problem. Let's analyze what are the logical reasons why Islam has permitted some men to have more than one wife. By nature, male and female are born in equal proportion. But any pediatrician will tell you that the female child medically is a stronger child. She can fight the germs and diseases and the toxins much better than the male child. So in the pediatric age itself, there are more male children dying as compared to female children. So female children are more in number as compared to male children. As life goes on, there is death due to cigarette smoking, due to alcoholism, due to accident, due to war. There are more men dying and males dying as compared to females and women. Today in the world, there are more women as compared to men. Except in few third world countries like India and China, there are more men as compared to women. The reason is because of female feticide and female infanticide. Every day in India, on an average, 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they are females. And according to the same report which came on BBC, on the topic assignment, let her die, a British reporter by the name of Emily Beckin, she says that out of 10 children born alive in Tamil Nadu government hospital, four are put to death. Out of 10 female children born alive in Tamil Nadu government hospital, four are put to death. That means every day, besides female children being killed, every year on average, more than one million fetuses are being aborted after the end of the females. If we stop this evil practice of female feticide and female infanticide, even in India very soon, the female population will outnumber the male population. But if we analyze the statistics of New York, in New York alone, there are one million female more than male. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million female more than male. In UK alone, there are 4 million female more than male. In Germany alone, there are 5 million female more than male. In Russia alone, there are 9 million female more than male. And God alone knows how many millions of females are more than the males throughout the world. But if I agree with the non-Muslim that every man should marry only one woman, and suppose your sister happen to live in America, or my sister happens to live in USA, and if the market is saturated, every man has found a life partner for himself. Yet there will be 7.8 million females in USA who will not find life partners. And suppose your sister happens to be one of those unfortunate 7.8 million females who has not found a life partner, or if my sister happens to be one of those 7.8 million American women who have not found a life partner, the only option remaining for her is that she either marries a man who already has a wife or become public property. Public property? Brother Zakir, such a harsh word. I say it is the most sophisticated word I can think of. I cannot think of a better word. There's no option. You either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. And if we analyze in the American society, the statutes of USA tell us that on average, an American 
has eight different sexual partners before he settles down with one. Some may be having five, some may be having 10, 20, 30. On average, eight different sexual partners before he settles down to before he settles down with one. See, having mistresses in USA is common. You can have as many as you want. One, two, ten, twenty, no problem. But having two legal wives, having more than one legal wife doesn't go down their throat. See, when a woman is a mistress, she does not get a right. She is dishonored. She is insulted. In Islam, when a man has more than one wife, both the wives get honor. They get their rights. They get protection. So this is the irony. Mistress is no problem, as many as you wish. But having more than one wife legally is a problem. So the only solution for the surplus woman in the world is polygyny, which is mentioned in the Quran. I am aware, under normal circumstances, no woman would ever like to share her husband. I agree with that. We have to be honest. That no woman under normal circumstances would like to share a husband. But the Islamic Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. A good Muslim, a good Muslim woman who knows the world scenario would not mind sharing a husband to prevent her other Muslim sister from becoming a public property. She would not mind bearing the small loss to prevent a big loss, to prevent the system from becoming public property. This is Islam. Islam is the only solution to the problem of humankind. Whatever the media portrays about Islam, if the teaching is part of Islam, if they're saying it's a problem, actually that is the only solution. And a person can keep on giving examples. Time doesn't permit us. But Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 54, Allah khairul makreen. They planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planner. See, whatever the media is doing, Alhamdulillah, whatever they plan, Allah is the best of planner. We know a few years back, there was a person by the name of Salman Rushdie who wrote a book. Against the Quran, against the Prophet, the satanic verses. The act was wrong, to be condemned. Net result, many people, many of the non muslim wanted to know what are these satanic verses. And many of the non muslim read the Quran. They read the translation of the Quran. And hundreds and thousands of non muslims only because of Salman Rajdi, they accepted Islam. What Salman Rajdi did was wrong. His planning was something else, but Allah is the best of planner. We take the example of 11th of September 2001. The destruction of the Twin Towers. Act is wrong. Quran says you can't even kill any human being. In Surah Mahidah chapter 5 verse number 32. If anyone kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for person who has created corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saved a human being, it is as though he has saved the whole of humankind. So the act was wrong, thousands of human beings died. But the net result, people wanted to know what kind of a religion of terrorism is this? And the media is always portraying Islam, religion of terrorism, terrorism. And number one seller became the translation of the glorious Quran. They wanted to read the Bible of the Muslim. They don't even know it's called the Quran. And when they read this word of Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. Many of them accepted Islam. According to statistics, immediately nine months after 11 September, 34,000 Americans accepted Islam. According to Yohan Redley, the British reporter who had gone to Afghanistan, she says in a span of nine months in UK alone, 22,000 Britishers they accepted Islam. The rate has increased. If Islam is the religion of terrorism, why should people accept Islam? As I said, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 54, Makru Allah, Wallahu khairul makreen. They planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planner. Islam is not the problem. It is the solution to the problems of humankind. 
I'd like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Sulay Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 19, which says, In Nadina in the Lyle Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. Wa akhra dawana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. 15 lakh rupees amount. I thought that since Chennai there are more than 5,000 people here, it should have been much more. I thought you were saying one and a half crore. I'd just like to let you know I'm not a fund collector. I don't say in public. But just for your information, that we Muslims are supposed to be one of the most charitable people in the world. Yes or no? Do you know there was a program that took place exactly one year before in Bombay? A person by the name of Pastor Benny Hinn. Have you heard of him? Benny Hinn? He comes on God TV. Who has heard of Benny Hinn? Benny Hinn. See, you haven't heard of him, that means he's not popular, correct? He's not that popular. Yet, in Bombay, when he had a program, he had a, three, I think he had a four-day program for three hours each. Four-day program for three hours each. He came from America. He is an evangelist. Do you know the budget they had there only for four days, three hours each? Here we have for ten days, full day. That is equal to one day of ours. Do you know what was the budget? Can anyone guess? Five crores. It was twenty crores. Twenty crores only for twelve hours. Only for 12 hours, 20 crores was the budget. And it was mainly done by a few individuals. By a few individuals in terms of dollars, if you convert, it comes to more than $5 million. And again, he's coming in Bangalore. Uh, I think on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, he's going to come to Bangalore. And I saw in the Chennai papers, his advertisement coming, Benny Hinn. 20 crores, that is the figure told by the newspapers, inside reports says it's much higher. 20 crores. 20 crores. And compared to this 60 lakhs, I think the amount is peanuts, but the effort is, mashallah, far superior. We see a 10-day program, mashallah, and that is only he coming and just saying a few words and singing, etc. And we Muslims are supposed to be the most charitable people. We Muslims are expert, mashallah, in giving duas which is required. A prophet said, do du'as, Allah said, do du'as. But everybody said, I'm du'a karenge to my life. Du'a, we'll do du'a. Why du'a is free? When the Christian missionary says, pray, he means money. If you're aware how the Christian missionary activity works abroad, if you've heard of Jimmy Swaggart, surely Jimmy Swaggart, have heard of Jimmy Swaggart? The person who debated with Sheikh Ahmed Didat. Have you heard of him? See, mashallah, people have heard of him. Jimmy Swaggart. He requires a budget of more than a million dollar a day to keep his head above water. Million dollar a day. More than five crore rupees a day he requires to keep his head above water. Five crore a day. Same with Billy Graham, all these people. Their budget is 500 million dollars a year, one billion dollar. They have a big budget. Compared to the peace exhibition, this budget is nothing. And we Muslims are supposed to be the most charitable people in the world. And I always had high regards for people of Chennai. I've never been here. I've told, I was told last year that people give, etc. What, what I request, that du'as are required. Allah's help is number one. With, without Allah's help, nothing happens. But whatever actions are there, intentions is a must. But whatever we have, alhamdulillah, Allah says in the Quran, see, I gave a solution to the problem of humankind. Now let's see how many people follow this solution. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 261, if you sow one grain in the way of Allah, Allah promises you seven years, each year bearing 100 grains. That means if you give one corn in the way of Allah, Allah will give you seven years, buta. Each one having 100 grains. That means if you put one grain, Allah will give you 700 grains. In business terminology, it is 70,000% profit. How much? 70,000% profit. I don't know of any business 
which promises you 70,000 percent profit. Allah says, and He will give you multiple times more. So if you sow one grain in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah promises you to give 700 times more, 70,000 percent. We Muslims say we have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If suppose, I have to tell you that I've got a business which will give you double profit, 200 times, not 700, 200. 200% profit. Believe me, everyone out here, whatever savings you have, you'd put every saving of your, every penny of your saving in that business. Allah promised this 700 times. So this is an act of charity. And surely for this exhibition, you can use various types of charity, mashallah. You can even use, scholars have agreed that you can even use zakat fund. It comes in Fi sabilillah and muallah khutu al qulub. This, we have to see that whatever savings we have, if you really want to invest in a business, the best business is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best bank you can keep your money is the bank of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you get the maximum returns. So I feel that I would like to see more of the Chennaites, the people of Chennai. That how much can you come forward and invest your money in the bank of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah promises 700 times minimum. So I feel that the 15 lakh figure is very low. I feel we should collect enough fund here so that the next exhibition also can be run by the collection now. That's the way it should run. And I've heard a lot of people coming, mashallah, people clapping, people saying Allah Akbar, alhamdulillah. Summa alhamdulillah. But you should see the action also. I want to see from here, from the brother, mashallah, there's a brother who gave 300,000 rupees, 3 lakh rupees, and maybe the collection has gone 5, 6 lakhs, not 6, 7, not more than that. I want to see from here, before we start the question and such, so that we can start early. That who would like to pledge an amount which fulfills the deficit? I'm assuming that the collation may be about six, seven lakh rupees. The totaling hasn't been done. I may make a mistake. Who can fulfill the deficit of that amount? Whether immediately on a span of few months. And I believe that the people of Chennai, mashallah, there are big merchants. Leather merchants, diamond merchants, garment merchants. Who among this audience of 5,000 would like to pledge an amount that can fulfill the deficit? Say so 8 lakh rupees. Deficit of the amount laid down. Any brother out here? Even those who have donated earlier, if they want to invest in Allah's bank, Allah guarantees 700 times profit. 700 times minimum and multiple times more. Any brother? And Allah says in the Quran that charity is of two types. One is such a charity that if your right hand gives, the left hand should not know. And the other type of charity that you should be known to the people. So depending upon what type of charity it is, I feel this type of charity, both type of charities can be done here, either it is that no one should come to know. But in these types of fundraising, when a person lays an initiative, all the people that follow that initiative even give the sawab for that. So the person who gets up first, it is not that he has to hide his name. Fine, if you want to conceal on him, there's no problem. So inshallah, I expect that before the question and session ends, or if someone wants to pledge now, does anyone like to pledge now to fulfill the deficit of the target laid down by the organizers? Anyone? MashaAllah. The brother has raised his hand. Jazakallah shukran brother. May Allah reward you. I know you wouldn't like to mention your name, but just, I would like to know your name, brother. The name of the brother. 
سوری فیضل ماشاء اللہ میں اللہ ریوارڈ فیضل بردر فیضل that he has made the initiative that what the organizers and laid the target for this he wants to fulfill part of the target inshallah but the faisal has pledged 25000 rupees may allah reward him maybe whatever amount allah has given him it is not the amount as we know the hadith the hadith umar may allah be pleased with him he gave half his wealth for charity i know the background and he thought that his was the maximum and hazrat abu bakar in terms of money what was less but the prophet said that his sawab is no because he gave everything so the sawab is in terms of how much allah has given you it is not the amount what allah has given you the percentage that you give it carries weight rather than the amount so inshallah we believe that are there any other people who would like to support this cause so that we can start the question and session any other brother any other brother who would like to any other brother mashallah one two any other assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I have never seen something of like this before. Dr. Zakir Naik and Brother Yasir Fazaga is working very hard to save this exhibition. Trust me, brothers and sisters, Zakir Naik has never raised funds anywhere in his meeting. For the first time, he is raising funds just because he does not want this exhibition not to happen this next year. To save this exhibition, he is taking all the efforts. Now it's left up to you, brothers and sisters, how you can cope up. He is talking not only to cover up the deficit. He is saying the funds should be in excess, so that for the next year the funds should be already available, so that we can do the exhibition next year. If that is the case, Alhamdulillah, we can do the exhibition next year. Otherwise, one or two persons taking the burden of this entire exhibition will be difficult. Jazakallah, brother Zakir Naik. Jazakallah, brother Yasser Fazal. And the organizers didn't tell me to take part in the in this fundraising, and I've never taken part in any fundraising in India. I've done a couple of times outside in Bahrain. in uae in usa the amount in bahrain was alhamdulillah 30 lakhs in uae it was 50 lakhs in us in chicago it was 1.2 crores they got 250000 mil 250000 dollars mashallah there is a brother by the name of afra kasim who has pledged 100000 rupees may allah reward you brother So I would like to know that whether the people of Chennai love more of Islam as compared to Bahrain, where I went in Dubai, in Chicago. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars means about one and a half, one point two crores, and that came even in the papers. So, inshallah, are there any other brothers? There were three, four brothers. Inshallah, the pledges are coming. Any brothers who would like to invest with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? Minimum 700 times Allah promises, 70,000 percent profit. I don't know if there's any businessman who gets close to 70,000 percent profit. The time is running short. We like to start the question and session. Any brothers would like to add on to the pledges, so that at least we meet the target of the organizers. Any other brothers? I would like some hands up. any brothers any sisters mashallah one more brother alhamdulillah may allah reward you jazakallah khair brother last before we start the question and session is the last time the appeal is being said yeah prabhu who doesn't want to be named for giving 5 lakhs mashallah there is another anonymous brother he prefers his name not being mentioned he has pledged 5 lakh rupees <laughs> mashallah another brother salman brother mohammed salman he has pledged 25000 rupees i hope the people of china at least keep my respect at least we collect like 15 lakhs if it is not 
then I don't want to lose faith in the people of Chennai. Because the organizer has 15 lakhs, which I feel is a very small amount. So if it doesn't reach, I really would be disappointed. So inshallah, the question and session will start. And in between the question and session also, if anyone wants to pledge, they can keep on pledging. So in between the question and session, there may be certain chits that have been, maybe the iman of some people arises, maybe after the answers, depending upon the, how the questions and how the answers are. So inshallah, in between also people would like to give to the volunteers, inshallah, brother, brother Ashraf Mahmoudi, in between these question and session, he will mention the names of the people who have played, inshallah. And we'll start with the question and session, which is more important than the talk, inshallah. Okay, can we have the first question from the sister's side? We would, we would prefer having, giving preference to questions by non-Muslims. We have uh, three mics put up in front of us. There are two mics for the gents, one on my right, one on my left, and one mic in the middle, right in front of us, for uh, the sisters. I request all our brothers uh, to form a queue before the mic <clears throat> so that we don't waste time between two questions and the preference will be given to the non-Muslims. Do we have a question from the sister's side? Any non-Muslim sister? If there are no sisters, can we have a question from the brother's side? Please mention your name and your profession and please, please uh, be brief when you pose the question. Assalamu alaikum. Can we have, excuse me, can we have a non-Muslim brother who can pose a question? Volunteers can please see if there are non-Muslim brothers and sisters who are interested in asking questions. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ranga and I belong to Hindu family. Basically, I'm uh, from a Brahmin family. And uh, I came to, I mean, I have been in the search of God for a long while, for the past seven years. I have gone to various traditions or religions, right from Hindu Brahmin to Christian. And I am at last a Muslim. Uh, first of all, my first question is, actually, the Quran has basically two parts with, with my context. That is, one which speaks with respect to human beings. What humans should do, what are their uh, works, uh, what should they do not do, uh, they should not do, and uh, what are their works to be done, what are the rules and regulations they should follow. The other thing is, which is not known to the human beings and which Quran says, like uh, how God is, what is his, his creation, and uh, what are his uh, uh, abilities or power or so, and such things. My first question is, why not worshipping God is a sin? Please, uh, I repeat once again, why not worshipping God is a sin? Because right from my birth, I have been uh, hearing about the word sin. A sin, with respect to me, is something which harms me or my neighbor directly or indirectly, mentally or physically. But in the context of uh, not worshipping Allah or God, I do not harm anybody. Then why does he punish him? <clears throat> well, that's a very good question. According to him, the definition of sin, according to our brother, is that if I harm my neighbor or some other human being, it's a sin. So worshipping God, why is it a sin? I'm not harming anyone. And surely God doesn't get harmed. That's a very good question. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require your praises or your worship. Allah doesn't require. But Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dariya, chapter number 51, Verse 56. We have created the men and the jinn not but to worship him. One of the purpose of creation is to worship. But Allah says, Allah doesn't require your praises. Allah is free of all wants. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almighty God is free of all wants. He does not require your praises. See for example, we say Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Whether you say or not, Allah will yet be the greatest. Not that if you say a thousand times, Allah will become more great. Allah is always the greatest, whether you say or not. It will not make any change in Allah. But why do we say? Why do we pray to Allah? Why do we worship Him? It's a very good question. The reason is, I gave part of the answer in my talk. That if we want to listen to anyone, for example, if your mother has a heart problem, and suppose a quack or a layman on the street tells you that this is the treatment, will you believe? No. But if you know that there is a heart specialist number one in the world, he is the best in the world, if he gives you advice, then will you follow for your mother? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Because you know he is number one in the world. Similarly, in our salah, when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
in the Islamic context, we do salah. We are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reason we are praising Him is because Allah is the greatest, Allah is the most wise, Allah is the most merciful, Allah is the most knowledgeable. The moment we say He is the greatest, He is the most knowledgeable, He is the most wise, that means we are agreeing He is number one. That means whatever advice He gives us will be beneficial for us. So when we find the advice in the Quran, when we praise Him, we are bound to even follow his advice. When we say he is the most greatest, he is the most wise, he is the most knowledgeable. Now whatever advice he is giving you for the solution, for the humankind, you tend to follow. If you wouldn't have agreed that he is the best, he is the most wise, he is the most knowledgeable, you wouldn't have followed his advice. That's the reason in the starting of my talk also I proved to you the credential of this Quran. So the reason Allah is asking you to worship him, it will benefit you. If you worship, it will not benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is free of all wants. See, Allah has created everything in the universe. Nothing is dependent on Him. But everything is dependent on Him. Me, sorry. He is independent of everything. I'm sorry. He is independent of everything. And everything is dependent on Him. With all His creation is dependent on Him. He is independent of everything. He doesn't require. So when you worship Him, you follow His guidance, it is benefiting you. So according to your definition of sin, if it harms anyone, it's a sin. It is harming yourself. The moment you worship him, you are getting guidance, how to lead a life, where you should not rob, where you should not cheat, you should be honest. If you stop this, it is causing a loss to you. So by worshipping, you are benefiting yourself. So according to your definition, if you don't worship him, it is causing loss to you, therefore it's a sin. Hope that answers the question. Just to go. Sure. Uh... The next one is, okay, if Quran has stamped that, that not worshipping is sin. If I am a person that I am not worshipping God, but I am go doing good to everyone. Say for instance, it is a, for example I am taking, I did uh, good things for my family, everybody and so, but I have not agreed with Allah. Then after my death, in the day of judgment, if Allah pushes me into the hell, uh, for the only sake that I am not worshipping Him. So what is the... Uh, purpose of the verse, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, that is the God being most merciful and most beneficent. But where is the mercy? I don't see the mercy there. The brother asked the second part of the question. He is he a hypothetical question. He does all good things, maybe honest, charity, etc. But he does not worship Allah. So only for that one thing of not worshipping Allah, can he put him in hellfire? Is your question. Very good question. Brother, when I was in school, I passed my school in 1982. There were six compulsory subjects. Six compulsory subjects. Mathematics, English, Science, Geography, History, Hindi, compulsory. Similarly, for going to Jannah, there are four criteria according to Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3. Allah says, Wal as inna insana fi khus illa lazina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is verily in loss in khasara, except those who have faith, those who do righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. The criteria to go to heaven in the hereafter is we should have faith, iman, do righteous deed. In righteous deed, besides, besides doing good thing, being honest, not to rob, not to harm anyone, being kind, being merciful, worship also comes one, one of the righteous deeds. But faith is number one, number two is righteous deed, third is exhorting people to truth, and fourth is exhorting people to patience and perseverance. So agree, I agree with you that maybe you are very good, very honest, etc. But if there's no faith, that means you fail in one subject. Now in my ICSC when I passed 10 standard, if I tell you I got 95 marks in 5 subjects, but in science I got 20 out of 100. The passing was 40% in ICSC. If I get 20 out of 100 in one subject and the remaining subject I get 95, or say I get 100 out of 100, Will I pass under 10? No. Why? The rule is I should pass in all the six subjects. Similarly, to enter Jannah, you have to pass in all four criteria. Iman, belief should be there. Righteous deed is one part of it. So for you to enter Jannah, there are four criteria, four subjects you have to pass in. Iman, belief. Second is righteous deed, which involves many things, including worship. Third is exhorting people to truth, calling people to the truth. Haq and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. So if you, any one of this is missing, you may get 100 out of 100 in righteousness, if I agree with you. But in Iman, in belief, you are failing. Imagine, suppose you 
you don't have the funds to do studies, fine? And suppose someone funds your scholarship. He gives your scholarship. You don't know the person. Or, fine, you know the person. He has given you scholarship. And he has taken care of all of your studies. And you become a doctor. He has spent lakhs of rupees on you. And imagine, you look after the other people, but don't thank the person who has funded you. Fine? So is it human or inhuman? The person who helped you. See, whether you thank him or not doesn't make a difference to him. He has helped many people. But yet, it will be a sin that the person who has helped you and made you a doctor because of which you became famous and you became rich, etc. If you have not thanked him, it is a sin. So similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reason you have to thank him is so that you follow the guidance. And without thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can never have all righteousness. Therefore, I said a hypothetical statement. You made a hypothetical statement. I do all good things, but don't, don't worship God. I don't thank him. I don't believe in him. It's hypothetical. To do all good, you should follow the guidance of the Creator. Therefore, one of the reasons to go to Jannah is having faith in Him and even worshipping Him. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the question? And your second part of the question was, if He is merciful, if He is just, etc. Brother, your last part of the question is that Allah is most merciful, Allah is most just. It is like you telling me that in an examination, the teacher gives the examination and there are some students who fail. The student who fails tells the teacher, Teacher, you are so merciful, why don't you pass me? The teacher can pass. But if the teacher passes the student who has failed, all the others will say, the teacher is unjust. So besides Allah being merciful, Allah even says in Surah uh, Nisa chapter 4, verse 40, He is never unjust in the least degree. So if Allah puts you in heaven, through His mercy, the other people will object that that is injustice. When you have told a person who doesn't worship, who doesn't believe, you go to hell, why have you put? So even if Allah wants to put, if he puts you in hell, if you have done shirk, if you have associated partners, it is going against his justice. So like a teacher who teaches everyone and says, okay, do good things. If the teacher wants, teacher can pass everyone. But if the teacher passes the student who has not done well, so the other people will say the injustice. So next examination, the other students also will not study. Fine? So tomorrow you come and tell me, I have done murder. I have raped a girl. Allah is more just. Why does he put me in heaven? So if Allah says, yes, I put you in heaven, the girl who's raped will object that where is the justice of Allah? That man raped me and you say I'm merciful. So Allah besides merciful is even just. Hope that answers the question. There are some brothers who have all uh, pledged to give 5,000 rupees each. We have brother Muhammad Zahir Abbas, brother S.A. Kadir, brother Muhammad Wahid. Yeah. Can we have the next question from the brother here? Yes, I am Srinivas Zainga. I come from Prichy. I'm seeing the hat. And if I should appropriately introduce myself, Abhivadiya Angirasa Bharaspatya Bharatwaja Triyare Shikha Pravanamita Bharatwaja Gotraga Dakshayani Sudraga Samasagga Dhyahe Srinivasa Sharma Anamam Agamasmi Buhu. This is my full name. Which means to say I come from the 145th direct generation of the Sri Vaishnavit Bhattacharya priesthood community. And I work as a Pujari in a Vaishnavite shrine somewhere around Trichy district. The major problem that I am facing in my day-to-day -day life is that I am not so aware about how I can really be a child of God, which is much puzzling my mind. I have been going across Rigveda, Yajurveda, Samaveda, Nalayra Divya Prabandha, Idhigasa, Purana, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, etc., 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 in the Hindu mythological subjects. In Sanskrit as well as in the Karanta language, nothing could reveal me the secret of keeping myself peace. So I was so badly cracked that I started taking Bible and I started reading Bible and to get through certain informations from the Bible. But it so happened that Bible also could not convince me for the reason from the book of John, in the gospel, it says, from the chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and came, same came from God, and dwelt among men, and it is the light of men. Excuse Which, me, brother. Oh, sure. Excuse me. This is a question time. Can you please pose the question? Yeah. I just wanted to know how I can have the remission for the sins that I have done in my life. What the Quran has got to give me the enlightenment about it. The brother asked, but that's the question that he comes from a Hindu family. He's read the Vedas and the other scriptures, the Upanishads, the Gita. 
he wanted to find the solution. He didn't get. Then he went to the Bible, he read, he quoted a verse of the Bible at the beginning of the word, the word was with God and the word was God. He gave the chapter number, it is Gospel of John, chapter number one, verse number one. It is the first verse. And the brother said he didn't find the solution even in the Bible. He wants to know what is the solution. What solution does Quran? He didn't find the solution even in the Bible. He wants to know what is the solution. What solution does Quran have? I'll come to the Quran. The Quran says in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 38, in every age have we sent a revelation. Every age, Almighty God has sent a revelation. And he has sent messengers, Allah says in Surah Fatih, chapter 35, verse number 24, wa in illa khalafi nazir. There has never been a people without a warner having lived amongst them in the past. All these books that you mentioned about Rig Vedas and the Atharva Vedas and the Upanishads and the Puranas, etc. If you had attended my talk last year, I gave a talk on similarities between Hinduism and Islam. And just a few days earlier, last Sunday, I gave a talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hindu scriptures. And there I proved that in your Hindu scriptures, it is mentioned that the Antim Rishi will come. A final Rishi in the Kalki Purana. He's mentioned chapter number 2, verse number 4, 5, verse number 7, 9, 11, and 15. It is also mentioned in the Bhagavata Purana, Khand 2, Khand 2, Adhyay number 2, Shloka number 18 to 20. And in several verses about the Kalki Purana to come, it speaks about the Antim Rishi, about Narashansa, and I've given the full talk, I don't intend repeating it again. If you read these scriptures, it says that there is a final Rishi to come. And they say that the name of the final Rishi, the father's name will be Vishnu Yash, that is same as Abdullah, the servant of God. His mother's name will be Sumati, which means peace, same as the mother's name of the last and final Muslim, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Amina. And the whole lecture can go on. Coming to the point that in all the Hindu scriptures, in most of the Hindu scriptures, the coming of the Antim Rishi is mentioned. Same thing in the Bible. I have given a talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible. I don't intend giving here. I'll just give you one quotation from the same gospel you mentioned. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. It says, I have many things to say unto you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto truth. He shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hear, shall he say. He shall glorify me. He shall show you things to come. That means, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, that there is another messenger to come. And in the Bible, even his name is mentioned in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Gospel of, uh, in, the, in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. And the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Narashansa. Nar means, since you know Sanskrit, Nar means a man. Shansa means one who praises. Huh? So Narashansa means the man who is praiseworthy. Which is exactly the translation of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you translate Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into Arabic, it means praiseworthy. So this Narashansa, if you refer to the Hindu scriptures, is mentioned in several places. If you read Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 18, verse number nine, Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 13, verse number three, Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 106, verse number four, Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 142, verse number four, Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number three, verse number two, Rig Ved, book number five, hymn number five, Sloka number two, Rig Ved, book number seven, hymn number two, verse number two, Yajurve chapter number 2, verse number 27. Yajurve chapter number 20, verse 37. Yajurve chapter number 20, verse 57. Yajurve chapter number 21, verse number 31. Yajurve chapter number 21, verse number 55. Yajurve chapter number 28, verse number 2. You can keep on, on and on and on. I can go on, but the, it's a question answer time, not a lecture time. So here again in your Hindu scriptures, in the Vedas, it speaks about the Antim Rishi, a final messenger to come. This final messenger is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As the Quran says in Surah Araf, Chapter number 7, verse number 157. It is mentioned in their scripture, the law and the gospels, about a messenger to come, the unlettered prophet, and several other quotations. Now, this final messenger got the final message, the glorious Quran. So, even if you read the other major scriptures, it says, an Antim Rishi is going to come, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going to come, and he got the final message. So, the solution to the problem, you said you're looking for truth and looking for guidance. Now, one thing is there that if you read all the other religious scriptures, all the other religious scriptures were meant for that time and for those people. 
And Almighty God did not think it fit to be preserved. But Allah says in the Quran in Surah Hijr, chapter number 15, verse number 9, we have revealed the Quran and we shall guard from corruption. Since this is the last and final revelation for the human beings, Almighty God has seen to, him, seen to it that he will preserve it. So all the other scriptures, even if they have changed, yet it mentions about the final messenger to come, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you read all the major scriptures, it points to the same messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the same message, the Quran. So this message, the final message of Almighty God, the Quran, is the only book that can get you salvation. As I ended my talk with the verse of the Quran from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, which says, In the deen in the law islam the only reason acceptable in the sight of God is submitting your will to God. So one thing is there, first, you have to find out the book of God. Fine? And after you find which is the book of God, if you submit your will and follow the commandments of Almighty God, then you will get total peace and total submission. So the only way what you're looking for peace is following the commandments of the last and final revelation that is the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of the last and final messenger of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, but do you have any? I just have one more small doubt. I agree with this one messenger who has got to come last for the remission of human sin. But I would like to put a question here. There are characteristics that are spoken about the messenger. All those characteristics has got to be fulfilled in the life of the messenger. That is very important based on the scripture. Being things as such, in my own religion it says that Om Sri Brahma Putraya Namaha, which means to say the only begotten son of God I worship thee. How does Quran guide an independent person or an individual towards that I have power? who is the real messenger who has come coronating down to this earth to save the sinners and to give him the remission for sins and to make him be presented in the kingdom of God at the end. That is very important. So, as far as I have gone studying in the Holy Scriptures of different religion, what the little brain of mine could understand is that, that the things that are conveyed about the messenger is not fulfilled very much in the life of the messenger itself. Then in that case, I go hunting behind a truth which is not truth, then how shall I be delivered from all things that is vacuum, all things that is not real? Where I will have the remission of sins? Where I will become a good man? How I will change myself in my life? How I will aim good things? How I will have good life? How I will be peace with the society? There are a lot of conflicts that is going in me. They are like a big warfare. I need a solution. I know Quran can introduce that in my life. I am so confident. I may be a Brahmin, but I keep trusting in Allah over here, only to get the solution. The brother asked a question. He asked for the solution and said that he quoted a Sanskrit word saying that I believe in the begotten Son of God. And you said that, begotten Son. And I feel that you have read the Bible also, and what I'm trying to quote is the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. For God sold of the world. You are trying to say Sanskrit is what I could get from you. You are trying to quote the Bible, rather. Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, which says, For God sold of the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not die but have everlasting life. What I can gain from your talk, that though you claim to be a Brahmin, you have read the Bible, what you're talking is the language of the Bible, correct? What, though you score Sanskrit, but I am in the field of comparative religion, I can judge myself. What you'd like to quote in Sanskrit was Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. Now coming to the question of Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, according to the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, it's revised by Thaidu scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different Christian denominations. These Christian scholars say that this word begotten in the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, is an interpolation. It's a fabrication. It's a concoction. And they threw it out of the Bible. So if you open the Bible of the Revised Standard Version, RSV, the word begotten is an interpolation. It is a fabrication. It's a concoction. I'm not saying that. Thai to Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different copy denominations, they say this word begotten is an interpolation. It's a fabrication. It's a concoction. That's the reason Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, Qul Allah Ahad, says Allah one and only, Allah Samad, 
Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufwan ahad. There's nothing like him. So Allah does not beget. Allah says in Surah Maryam chapter number 19 verse number 88 to 92 Allah says, Wa qalu taqazur rahmanu wa lada. They say Allah most gracious has begotten a son. Lakad jitu mushayyan idda. Indeed you have put forth a thing most monstrous. If anyone who says Allah has begotten a son, it is the biggest abuse you can give to Almighty God. As though the skies are ready to burst. The earth to split asunder. And the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. If anyone says Allah has begotten a son, if the sky had feelings, the Quran says, the sky would have burst open. The earth would have split asunder. The mountains would have fallen down to utter ruin. So Allah cannot beget a son because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the function of lower animal sex. You cannot attribute this function to Almighty God. Therefore, your Vedas, if you read, if you read your Veda, your Vedas, if you read, and the Upanishads, it's mentioned in Shweta Shatara Upanishad. Chapter number 6, verse number 9. Na kasya kasij, janita na chadipa. Of him, there are no parents. He has got no Lord. So your Upanishads and Veda say, the Almighty God cannot beget. And the Bible, what you quoted, it's an interpolation, it's a fabrication. And Almighty God says, if Allah has begotten a son, I would be the first person to bow down to him. The Almighty God cannot beget. So begetting is an animal act. So you cannot attribute such a function to Almighty God who is our creator. Therefore, brother, the verse you quoted also is a fabrication. And your Vedas also say that Almighty God cannot beget. He has got no parents. He has got no children. Similarly, what the Quran says, so regarding a question of someone coming down, someone coming down for your sins, what you're quoting is the Bible. Jesus Christ never said that. You're quoting the teachings of St. Paul, of St. Paul, that he came down as a lamb, and you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sin, and you'll get salvation. Fine? If you believe Jesus Christ is the Savior, you do any sin, you'll get salvation. So imagine... Suppose a human being comes and tells me, I believe Jesus is the savior. Then if he rapes, he'll be forgiven. If he robs, he'll be forgiven. See, if someone has paid for your sin, you can do any sin, correct? If someone tells me, go to a restaurant, all your bill is paid. I can have chicken biryani, I can have mutton pulao, I can have anything. So if you say that Jesus Christ has paid for your sin, tomorrow you can say, I can rape, I will not be punished. I can rob, I will not be punished. I can kill eleven, I will not be punished. So what kind of religion is this? If Jesus Christ, peace be upon you, has paid for your sin, that means you can't do any sin. So the whole world will be a big chaos. This is not the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that if you want to enter Jannah, paradise, you have to follow all the rules and regulations. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 20, Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Until the heaven and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. That means you have to follow each and every law. You have to worship the one true God. And God Almighty has got no son. He has got no begotten son. So therefore, if you read the last and final revelation, which is uncorrupted, the Quran, which is maintained in pure form, and if you follow the commandments and submit your will to this God, inshallah, you'll get total peace. Hope that answers the question. Before we move on, there are several slips which have come up over here. One sister has donated. All right, can we have the next question from a non-Muslim brother or a sister? Okay, there is a non-Muslim brother over here. You're most welcome. I'm Sattivel, doing third year B.Tech. Regarding polygamy, a friend told me, uh, Prophet had 11 wives. How could he justify that? Masha'Allah, Jazakallah for your support to the peace exhibition. Inshallah, we'll have more speakers coming in next year. Masha'Allah, may Allah reward all of you. The brother asked the question that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had 11 wives, how can you justify? And as I mentioned, man said that Quran gives permission in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 3. Marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. But for the Prophet, Allah says in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 52, that, O oh, Prophet, from this day, you are allowed to keep your wives. 
but do not exchange anyone. Do not exchange anyone, even if the beauty allows you. And again, in the earlier verses of Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse 50, 51, the permission of the Prophet has been given to marry and keep the wives. So for the Prophet Muhammad a special revelation comes in the Quran, special revelation came in the Quran, giving him permission to maintain his wife. Now, there are allegations laid down by skeptics of Islam that Nauz Billah, the Prophet, was hypersexual, and he had multiple wives, and he did it only for enjoyment, etc., and various allegations. But all these allegations can easily be replied to if you know the background, the life of the Prophet. History tells us, the seerah of the Prophet tells us, that Prophet Muhammad the first time he got married was at the age of 25. And he married a woman who was 15 years elder to him. At the, she was 40 years old, Hazrat Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her. So imagine a man who is hypersexual, why will he marry a woman who is 15 years elder to him? And she was widowed twice. And only after his first wife, Hazrat Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her, only after she expired, when the Prophet was more than 50 years, only after she expired did he marry all the other wives, all the other women. And all his marriages that took place after the first marriage, Hazrat Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her, was after the age of 50. So all his other marriages were after the age of 50, and except, except for two, with normal course of time, which were normal marriages. The other one was of Hazrat uh, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. All the other marriages, except for that two, one which was a virgin, all the other wives, they were either divorcee or they were widowed. Hundred percent, all of them, except for two. Now if you analyze the history, each and every marriage of the Prophet was for a certain cause, for a social benefit, for the spread of Islam. He being the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being the messenger of Almighty God. Each marriage was for the betterment of the spread of Islam. And a person can give a talk only on the marriages of the Prophet. Just to cut the answer short, I'll just mention in brief, that Hazrat Juwaira, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet. If you analyze the history, that she belonged to the Banu Mustalib tribe, Banu Mustalib tribe. And this tribe was a staunch enemy of Islam. And during the battlefield, when the Prophet married this uh, Juwaira, may Allah be pleased with her, the moment the Muslims won the war, and they captured the people of the Banu Mustalik tribe, they said that how can we keep prisoners, the relatives of the Prophet, and they let them go. The moment they let them grow free, this tribe accepted leadership of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Same we have the example of Hazrat Maimunna. May Allah be pleased with her. She was the wife of the Prophet. She was the sister of the wife of the chief of Najad. Now this tribe of Najad was against the Muslims, and history tells us they even killed 70 Muslims in a battle. So the moment the Prophet married this lady, immediately there was peace between the tribe. In this way, we have several examples. We have the examples of Hazrat Habiba, may Allah be pleased with her. And we have several examples in which the Prophet, may peace be upon him, he married the daughter of the chief of the Jewish tribe. He even married the daughter of, of Sufyan who was the chief of the Quraysh. So after this, the peace was there and it was responsible for even Fateh Makkah. History tells us. Then we have example that we know in history that uh, Zainab, may Allah be pleased with her. He had married her to the adopted son, Hazrat Zaid, may Allah be pleased with him. But the marriage didn't work out well. So the Prophet felt responsible. And after the marriage, after the divorce, with the so-called adopted son, he married this lady to prove that there's nothing like legal adoption in Islam, point number one. Point number two, that even a divorcee can be married. So all this was for social reform. So in this way, all the 11 marriages of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if I refer to my video cassette, Women Rights in Islam, I've given the details, what for a social cause, what for a just cause, it was not because he was hypersexual. If he was hypersexual, today science tells us that in your 20s and 30s, a person is more sexual as compared to in his 50s. So all his marriages, except for the first one, which was at the age of 25, 
all his other marriages were after the age of 50. So if the Prophet was hypersexual, no Billah, he should have married at an earlier age in his 20s and 30s, not in his 50s. So all of this was for a just cause and social cause. That is the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, gave him special permission to maintain all 11 wives. Hope that answers the question. Do you have a related question? Yes, brother. Speech. Okay, you can uh, come back some. We'll give you an opportunity to ask the question again. Can we have a question? Yes, my name is S. Govind Swami. I am a Hindu. I have been brought to this world and by the one and the only Allah. Now, since I have born in a Hindu family, I am following the Hinduism, which described me as a uh, coffee. So, if I be born in a Muslim family, I would have followed the uh, Muslim um, proceedings and I will be a Dinda. Why Allah made me to in, born in a Hindu family, which is a Kafir family, and uh, I, I have been introduced its, at my birth itself as a Kafir. Why it should be? Please explain to me in the, with the help of this uh, Quran. Brother, that's a very good question. He says he's a Hindu and he agrees Almighty God gave him life in this world. He's born in a Hindu family. And because born in a Hindu family, he's called as a Kafir. And he says that if I was born in a Muslim family, I would be Dindar. So who's to blame? I didn't choose to be born in a Hindu family. Almighty God to blame. So can we explain from the Quran that why is it such that I was born in a Hindu family? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. Deen al-Fitr means innate religion. Every child is born as a Muslim. Irrespective whether he's born in a Hindu family, Christian family, Jewish family, or a Muslim family, our Prophet said every child is born as a Muslim. Muslim by definition, brother, means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. The Prophet said afterwards, later on, he is influenced by his parents, by his elders, by his teachers, and then he starts doing idol worship, fire worship, and then he goes outside the fold of Islam. So, brother, every child, according to Islam, is born as a Muslim. Muslim means submitting his will to Almighty God. So every child submits his will to Almighty God. Later on, he deviates and goes to a wrong track. He may start doing fire worship, he may start doing idol worship, etc. So, the point to be clarified, brother, is that every child is born as a Muslim. If a child born in a Hindu family, if he dies as a child, at the age of one or two, he goes to Jannah. Why? Because he is Masum. But later on, if he grows and if he starts having his own will, then he, if he does something wrong, then he is responsible. Now, coming to your question, that fine, if Almighty God would have put me in a Muslim family, maybe, I would have, even if I grew up at the age of 40, 50 now, I would have been a Muslim. But now, because Almighty God put me in a Hindu family, so who's to blame? But first, I would like to reply to your question of the word Kafir. Kafir in Islam, it comes from the Arabic word Kufr, which means to reject. So Kafir means person who rejects. In Islamic terminology, it means a person who rejects Islam. So when a child is born, he doesn't reject Islam. Later on, he rejects. Now coming to your question, that Almighty God put me in a Hindu family, therefore even after the age of 40, 50, I'm yet a Hindu. Brother, if you are a Hindu, and if you read your Hindu scriptures, fine, suppose no one talks to you about Islam. If you read your Hindu scripture, as I told in the earlier answer, even if you read your Hindu scripture, Almighty God is giving guidance in your Hindu scripture, even though it may not be totally the word of God, even though it has been manipulated, in your Hindu scripture it is mentioned that the Antim Rishi will come whose name shall be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad. You have to follow him. So now God has told that even though he's put you in a Hindu family, whether he puts you in a Christian family, in the Christian scripture, the coming of the last and final messenger is mentioned. It tells that he will get a last and final message, the glorious Quran. So even if you as a Hindu read your scripture, I gave the talk last year, similarities between Hinduism and Islam. So even in Hinduism, idol worship is wrong. 
it what what the people talk today the scholars of hinduism is they are changing the scripture so to understand hinduism we have to go to your scripture based on the verse of the quran of surah al-imran chapter 3 verse 64 which says ta'ala ila kalmatin sawa in bayna baynakum come to common terms as been us and you which is the first term allah na'buda illa allah that we worship none but allah so if you read your scripture also in your scripture it says in sandogya upanishad chapter number 6 section number 2 verse number 1 ikam evidityam god is the only one without a second it's mentioned in sweta sita upanishad chapter number 4 verse number 19 na tasvi patima asti of that god there is no likeness almighty god has got no likeness it's mentioned in your scripture in yajurved chapter number 40 verse number 8 and 9 andhatme bhavishanti ya samuti mupaste they are entering darkness those who worship the asambuti that is the natural things like fire water air etc and the verse continues they are entering more in darkness those who worship the sambuti sambuti are those things which are created table chair idol etc so even if you read your scripture that scripture even though it is manipulated it is not maintained in its pure in its pure form yet it talks about a messenger to come prophet muhammad peace be upon him it talks about the last and final revelation of the glorious quran so even if you as a hindu if you read your scripture you have to come to the quran you have to come to islam so the thing is there that every individual has to do research Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fussilat chapter number 41 verse number 53 sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyanu anna al-haqq that soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their soul that this is the truth so Allah takes it upon himself that to every human being in his heart he will give the message of one god later on the person rejects it thinking that if i accept islam maybe i may have to stop stop my business which is dishonest i may have to stop my alcohol business we dealing alcohol i may have to do hijab so all these things almighty god himself gives it directly to every human being irrespective whether they're born in a muslim family or non muslim family so after the message is given to directly it is your duty to accept it for example now today you got the message now whether after my talk do you yet accept islam or not so tomorrow you can't tell to almighty god Almighty God, why did you make me born in a Hindu family? So Almighty God will tell you, okay, I made you born in a Hindu family, but I saw to it that somebody gave you the message. Many people may have given you earlier, but at least now I can bear witness on the day of judgment that on this day, on the eighth of January, I gave you the message. So on the day of judgment, you cannot tell to God, God, why was I born in a Hindu family? I will bear witness that I gave you the message. And if you accept Islam today, all your sins of the past, whatever your age is, will be forgiven. So now you have no excuse. So now, as an individual, you have no excuse. So therefore, it is the duty of every Muslim to convey the message. I can't force you to accept Islam. I can't take a gun and tell you accept it. Haram in Islam. It's prohibited. I can give you the message. Fazakir na man tamazakir. Allah says in Surah Ghasia, chapter number eighty-eight, verse number twenty-one, twenty-two. Your job is to deliver the message. I can't force you. Now I have delivered the message to you. Now once you understood the message, you have to accept Islam. If you don't accept Islam, you are held responsible. Similarly, there are many people born in Muslim family, but they aren't practicing Muslims. They are non-Sikh Muslims. They will not go to Jannah. People have a misconception just because by calling a Muslim name Abdullah, Zakir, Muhammad will not take us to Jannah. To go to Jannah, we should have Iman. As I mentioned, my earlier answer: Iman, faith, righteous deed, exhorting people to truth, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. So there is a misconception that everyone born in a Muslim family go to Jannah is totally wrong. People say, but the Hadith says. That anyone who reads the Shahada will go to Jannah, but see the Shahada means reading the Shahada and implementing on it. Just by saying La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger. Will not take you to Jannah. Even the Munafiks, the Munafiks, the hypocrites, even they said the Shahada. Will they go to Jannah? No. So besides saying the Shahada, before, besides calling ourselves Muslims, we should implement on the guidance of the Quran. of the creator that there is one god follow his commandments pray to him similarly so you and i at the end of the day we come in the same boat so many people who claim to be muslims calling muslim they will not go to jannah similarly many non muslim they accept islam thousands are accepting islam every day alhamdulillah so at the end of the day just by being born in a muslim family will not take you to jannah similarly just by being born in a non muslim family will not take you to hell 
So because it's the age of science and technology, mashallah, now you're, you're, I gave you the message. So on the day of judgment, you'll be held responsible. Why did you not accept the message? If you accept, all your previous sin will be washed away. Hope that answers the question. We'll take the next question from the sister's side. Now two mics have been provided for the sisters, one right in front of us, one on my left. We'll take the next two questions from the sister's side. I'm Sasi Rekha. Basically, I'm a Hindu. Uh, why Muslim brothers and sisters don't accept our prasad? Why don't they accept the prasad? Sister, that's a very good question. That why do the Muslim brothers and sisters don't accept prasad? Because Allah says in the Quran in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 173. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 145. And Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 115. Hurrimat alaykumul maitutu waddamu wa rahmul khinzir. Wa ma uhilla li gairil labi. Forbidden for you for food, ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is invoked. So any food on which any name besides Almighty God's name is invoked, it is haram in Islam. So that's the reason we don't take prasad. And similarly, similarly, even in your Hindu scriptures, worshipping anyone besides the true almighty God is prohibited. Even in your scripture. And if, we, if you can prove, if you can prove that the prasad who you give on, if that is almighty God, then we are to accept it. For example, if suppose there is a function of Ganesh Chaturthi, you know, Maharashtra is very common. Ganesh Chaturthi, do you have here also? Ganpati. Yes, we have it. See, but there are some Muslims who are afraid to do dawah. So they know having prasad is haram. But they are afraid to open their mouth. So if somebody gives prasad, what do they do? They say, Bismillah and have it. They are afraid to open their mouth. Thinking that if I open my mouth, the non-Muslim will become enemy. Why? It's so simple. If somebody calls me to a function of Ganesh Chaturthi and give me prasad, I'll ask a simple question that, who is this Ganesh? What is this prasad? This prasad is given to Lord Ganesh. So I ask him a simple question that, who is this Lord Ganesh? So the Hindu will tell us the story that, you know, Ganesh, he is the son of Shiva and Parvati. One day Shiva goes on expedition and his wife Parvati takes out dirt from the body and creates a son. And tells the son that you guard my house, don't allow anyone to enter. When Shiva comes back from the expedition, he's about to enter his house, and this young lad says, My mother is resting, you cannot enter. This Shiva gets irritated. He says, Who is this young? The contributions which have been given individually and put in the donation piece donation boxes have not been accounted for as yet. So uh, that has yet to be accounted, but we are we have reached around ten lakh seventy thousand as of now. It, yeah, can we have the next question from brother here? We'll come Harichandra, back. Here. Uh, according to Islam, the five times worship is a must for all the Muslims. Whether the God will be pleased only if you do a five time worship? No, I didn't get it. Yeah? But uh, the question that in Islam five time worship is a must. Will God only be pleased if you worship five times only? When I go to a doctor, he tells me that for a healthy body, you require minimum three meals a day. So similarly, for a spiritual body, for a spiritual soul, you require minimum five times salah. How? For a healthy body, you require three times meal. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 130, and in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, five times salah is the first and several ahadi. The reason is, brother, Salah, if you refer to my talk, on Salah, the programming towards righteousness. It is more of programming towards righteousness. Today that we see in the Salah, besides praising Almighty God, we are even thanking Him, and at the same time, we are even getting guidance from Almighty God. Now today we see so much of evil around us going around, that if you allow me to call the human being as a computer, it is the most advanced computer in the world. There are high chances that this computer can get deprogrammed. The amount of evil we see around us. So in the Salah, we have been guided that don't have alcohol, don't molest, don't cheat, don't rob, be honest, be just. So imagine we are being programmed minimum five times a day to be on the straight path. This is Almighty God, our Creator, who has made us. So He knows that minimum if you do five times programming, the man will be on the straight track. You can do more, you can even do Tahjud six times, but minimum five times. 
because he is a creator, how the doctor says minimum three meals for a healthy body. Similarly, our creator knows that minimum we have to be programmed towards righteousness five times a day so that we'll be on the straight path. Hope that answers the question. Do we have a question from the sister's side? Any non-Muslim sisters having a question in either of the mics provided? This is on behalf of a non-Muslim sister. While killing, an, while killing even an ant is considered as a sin, Islam says after saying a slogan, even animals can be killed and eaten. Is it not acceptable, sir? The sister has asked a question that Islam says that even killing an ant is a sin, so how can we kill an animal after saying a slogan? There are various hadith not to kill an ant, the hadith of Sunnah Nisai, hadith number 4209 that even killing a sparrow without a cause is a sin. So if the ant is troubling you and you know that uh, if it goes in your ear and you cause a problem, at well, that time killing it is permitted. But unnecessary without a cause, killing any living creature is a sin, whether it be an ant, whether it be a sparrow. But when we slaughter the animal, mainly for food that we have, it is with permission of Almighty God we say Bismillah Allah Akbar in the name of Allah who is great and then we slaughter because when we kill the animal it is for our food and Almighty God has given permission in Surah Mahindra chapter number 5 verse number 1 that lawful for you are the meat of the four-footed animal except those which have been prohibited. Further it's mentioned in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 5 and Surah Mu'minun chapter number 23 verse 21 that you can have the meat of the animals. So since Almighty God has given permission for you to have the meat of the animal by the way he has showed us. The Prophet has showed us that is Zabiya, it's permitted. Same thing is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, since it's the Hindu one, the Hindu lady is asking a question, that is mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 5, verse number 30, that Almighty God created some animal to eat and some to be eaten. If you eat the animal which God has created to be eaten, then you're not doing a sin. So similarly, among the permitted animals, if you slaughter them with the permission of Almighty God for your food, it is permitted, sister. And for the detailed reply, refer to my video cassette, is non-vegetarian food permitted or prohibited for human being, which gives all the argument on non-vegetarian food? Hope that answers the question. We'll perform the Zohar Salah by Jamaat in the same auditorium at 2.30 p.m. Can we have the next question from the brother's side, non-Muslim brother? Assalamu alaikum. Actually, it's a question from a uh, non-Muslim girl. She's a Christian girl. Uh, she's my colleague, actually. Uh, actually, we had an argument of uh, an energetic argument for one hour uh, last week. Uh, the topic was on uh, who is the original God. Actually, she gave some, uh, some verses from the Bible um, as a proof for it. Then I gave uh, your uh, uh, book, uh, actually, the concept of God in major religions. I gave your book uh, and I showed the various uh, things mentioned in that book. And uh, under the topic, uh, concept of God in Christianity, you, uh, you have mentioned some several points from the Bible itself to prove that uh, Jesus is not a begotten son of God, he is a messenger. So one of the verses you mentioned in your book is from the Gospel of Ch John, chapter 10, uh, verses 29, my father is greater than all. So, after that you stopped and you, 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 you have mentioned some other verses from some other chapters. So, he, he took it from, he, he showed me in the Bible, the next, the next verses in that same chapter, Gospel of John, chapter 10, 30 says, uh, my father and me, uh, my father and I are one. What is the clarification that I can give it to her? And one more question. One question time, brother. Okay. The other people. The question, the quotation of my and my father, it is not me and my father, but it is I and my father are one. The quotation, the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 30, I and my father are one. That is the quotation. And I have made a claim in the talk and even in the book that there is not a single unequivocal statement, not a single unambiguous statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. That is the claim I made. So your friend has put a claim that, fine, I and my father are one, is proving that he's Almighty God. Anyway, in Bible. I know so that, brother. Let me complete the answer. Or do you want to give the answer? You have asked the question, let me complete the answer. Fine. I know she's a Christian. I know she's not a Muslim. 
my challenge was to point out a single unequivocal statement, unambiguous statement, where Jesus Christ himself says that I am God, or where is the worship me. This quotation is, I and my father Ravan, from Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 30. For this, you have to go to the reference. If you see the context, the context starts as Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 23. It says, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, entered the temple in the Solomon's porch, all the Jews surrounded him. Verse number 24 says that the Jews asked him that, Art, art thou Christ? Art, art thou Christ? If thou art the Christ, tell us plainly. Asking that, are you God? Are you claiming divinity? Tell us plainly. Verse number 25 says, I have told you the works that I do, they bear witness of my father. I told you, but you believe not. Verse number 26. You are not my sheep. Verse number 27. I, I speak to my sheep. My sheep know me, they hear me, and they follow me. No man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse number 28. That my sheep, I give them eternal life. No man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse number 29. My father that give it to me is greater than all. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse number 30, I and my father are one. In context, verse number 28 says, that no man can pluck them out of my hand, out of Jesus Christ, peace be upon his hand. That means all his followers, no one can take him away from him. Verse number 29 says, no man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse number 30 says, I and my father are one. In purpose, Jesus Christ, and Almighty God are one. It doesn't mean one as a person. See, my father is a doctor and I'm a doctor. If I say I and my father are one in profession, it means in profession, not as a person. My father is a different person, I'm a different person. Yet the Christians say, no, no, brother Zakir, it is one in person. I say, okay, for sake of argument, I agree with you. For sake of argument, no? If you read further, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 21. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that my father is in me, I am in thee, telling his twelve apostles, we all are one. That means there are fourteen gods, correct? Almighty God, Jesus Christ, and twelve disciples. The same one is used here. That means they are one in purpose, giving the message of truth. That doesn't mean one in person. If you agree that one means one in person, then you have to agree there are fourteen gods. Again, Gospel of John chapter 17, verse number 23, Jesus Christ says, I in you, thee in me, we all are one. Twelve disciples and Jesus Christ, 13 gods. Yes? He said no. Further, verse number 31 says, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. So Jesus Christ speaks by upon himself, verse number 32, many good works have I done. For which of the good works do you stone me? So the Jews say, we don't stone you for good work. You blaspheme it, calling thyself God. So Jesus Christ speaks by upon himself, verse number 33, 34, isn't it mentioned in your scriptures that to whom the word of God has come can be called God meaning small g, and he quotes the Psalms, chapter number 82, that ye are gods to whom the word of God has come, meaning a small g, a small god, meaning a messenger of God. So if we read the context, Jesus Christ speaks up and says, that his father and he are one in purpose. That means the message that he's giving is same of that of his father. Hope that answers the question. We are running out of time, but we see that there is one non-Muslim brother patiently standing where so but sometimes you can just ask your question briefly. I am Ramesh. I am a student of GKN College of Engineering. My question is, could you, from Islam point of view, could you give me the reason for tsunamis and other tragedies from which took away the life of small children? Up to this now, they have not been any sin. Without committing any sin, if they take you to the judgment, what will you do? Do you think it has a mistake? Whether that's the question that what is, what logic can you give for the tsunami wave, the harbor wave? and in which many innocent people were killed, children were killed, and without sin, if you take to judgment, what will happen? If you don't do a sin, if you go to a court, then you go to Jannah. I told that earlier, that if any child, whether born in a Hindu family or a Christian family at the age of one, he's a Muslim. So, and I told in the first talk of man in this peace exhibition, I said that whenever a, whenever a calamity comes, it is either a test or a punishment. Those people who have done a wrong thing, have done a sin, it's a punishment for them. Those who are on the right track, it's a test for them. Maybe Allah wants to give you a higher reward. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 6 and verse number 2, Allah zi khalaq al-mawta wal-hayata. 
it is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. And Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155, Surely we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of life and loss of property and all that you have earned in your life. The Almighty God says, we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of property. So in this, in this tsunami wave, many people died, many property was lost. Allah is testing, surely will test. But for those people who have done a sin, it's a punishment. Those who have not done, it's a test. For example, and more difficult the test that you pass, higher is the reward. Maybe some people died, innocent people, three people of the family died, one person is alive. So three people, if they were good human beings, they go to Jannah. To the fourth person is a test. Now Allah wants to test him that after so much of destruction, loss of property, loss of relatives, does he yet believe in Almighty God? It's a difficult test. Now more difficult the test, more high is the reward. If you pass your graduation, if you pass BA, you only get a BA degree. But if you pass MBBS, which is more difficult, you get doctor. Correct? But to pass MBBS is more difficult than to pass a BA, Bachelor of Arts. But the moment you pass MBBS, you have to slog out, it's difficult. But the moment you pass, you get a high a reward, doctor. Similarly, if the test is difficult, if your family members have been killed, if there's loss of property, and you're on the straight path, Allah wants to test you, maybe He wants to give you Jannat Firdos, the higher level in Jannah. Hope that answers the question. You have a related question? Yeah, related question. The same thing is, then you mean to say that we need to have many tsunamis to have a better testing. The brother asked the question that, does it mean that we to have we should have many tsunami, tsunami, tsunamis, tsunamis? That's Allah's planning. If the see that that means the examiner decides whether should I give a difficult test or easy test. You can't tell the examiner by give me a difficult test always. Sometimes Allah may give earthquake, earthquake. Sometimes those who are in the sin also He gives them. See those people who have done sin also they need luxurious life. Allah is giving them rope. So whenever any reward is given, it may. Whenever any good thing happens, it's either reward or punishment, even vice versa. There are many people who are smugglers, they are rapists, and they are leading a good life. Allah is giving them rope to hang themselves. That means to those people who have done, if any good thing happens to you, if you are on the right path, it's a reward. I am talking the other way around now. And if you are on the wrong path, it's a test for you. Allah is giving you, okay, you think that all this wealth will take you to Jannah, will take you to heaven, Allah gives you more wealth. And you keep on thinking that, oh, I'm a great minister, I can do smuggling, I can do this. But in the year after, you're losing. So Allah tests different people in different ways. Sometimes with tsunami, sometimes with 11 September, sometimes with flood, sometimes with maybe the crop is very good and there are good things. So Allah tests different people in different ways. Depending upon the test you have, Allah will judge you accordingly. If the examination is difficult, the correction will be lenient. If the examination is easy, the correction will be strict. So based on this, he is the creator, he is the examiner. Therefore, Quran says, he is Malik Yawm al He is the master of the day of judgment. Hope that answers the question.